Good morning, PV. Good morning, PV Online. Nice to have you with us. It's great for you all to be here. That last song that the praise team sang, sang by Zach Williams. I don't know if you know a lot about Zach, but he's an amazing young man, loves the Lord, and he does a tremendous prison ministry. He sings a lot in the prisons. He talks about, you know, freedom and being set free. And it's interesting because I think this is a man whose heart is with people who are in, in jail. And he talks so much about prison. If you don't know him, take it to listen to him. Zach Williams, maybe many of you do, hope you do. A um, couple announcements, two. We have a picnic today. It's today. And we ask people to please sign up for the picnic so we have an idea how many people are coming. But if you didn't sign up, say, hey, I didn't sign up, we weren't planning on coming, but now we can come. If you're visiting with us and you say, hey, I just stopped in, you know, and I'm, that picnic sounds interesting, but I didn't get a chance to sign up, don't matter, come. We will have food, all right? We'll have a nice time. It's out in the country. It's at Herschel Park. And you say, where's that at? Stop at the Welcome Center. We have directions there. If you follow the directions and you get near the river, you are really lost. <laughs> it's only six miles from here. All right? It's easy to find. You go that way toward Winterstown. You go through the little town of Winterstown. Outside of the little town of Winterstown are two S curves. Go like that. On that bottom S curb, there's a garage. You turn left. Follow the directions. You'll get there. And it's in cornfields. All right? It's sort of like in, the, in farm country. It's a great little place to be. Hope you'll come. Honestly, come. We would love to have you. Second, on September 12th, we are starting our discipleship classes. There are 12-week discipleship class. It's really going to be neat. We're taking and, and we're going to see a video at the end of today. It tells you a lot about the class, why we want people to take it and, and uh, you know, learn about what it means to be a disciple of Christ and to grow in the Lord. Uh, we are going to, next week, start a new series. And I'm building this next series. I want it in line with the series we just did, Not Afraid. Not Afraid is challenging us to be trusting God, not be afraid, deal with things that are going on today. But then the next series is called In God We Trust. Because I think sometimes our biggest question, our biggest issue is that we don't trust God. We trust a lot of other things but we really don't trust God like we're called to do. So we're going to look at that over the next four weeks after today. Today we're going to finish up Not Afraid. And, you know, when we talk about this being not afraid and we talk about the time we live in, the culture, the times, the pandemic, the uncertainty of the world, do you ever feel unsettled? I do. Sometimes it's just like, man, I remember, you know, seems like the good old days, and you didn't have too much cares, and everything was good, but now you turn on the news, and they're telling you, this many, and the hospital is full, and this many are dying, and now we got Afghanistan, and this and that, and what's going on, and everything else, and it's just chaos, and we got a hurricane that's going to hit, and all these things, and after a while, don't you just feel a little unsettled? I do. At times, it's like, <sighs> and when I do, what I like to do is I like to go, if I get that feeling, just that, mm, I want to go to Scripture where I can find, okay, let me look in the Bible where there was a time that this might have happened, that there might have been this unsettled, there might have been this uncertainty, there might have been some things that caused some anxiety in people. And what happened, what did they do, how did they handle it? This morning, I'm going to look at one of those situations, all right? It was when the church of Jesus Christ, the way, the followers of Christ, were just really getting started. And Paul and Silas had been on their missionary journey. Churches were started. They'd been on the second missionary journey. Christianity was growing. And 
Paul had this desire. When they started, they went around the Mediterranean Sea, and they visited all main cities, cities that were seaports. And the reason Paul and Barnabas did that was because it was a place where people from all over of a certain region would come in. They'd sell their goods. They'd buy goods. And then they'd go back out to the regions. So he said, we can start a church in those cities. We'll be able, then the church will be able to reach out into the region. And that's exactly what happened. It was great. But Paul had a hope. He had a prayer. He had this desire. I'm, we're going to Rome. I want to preach at Rome because Rome's the place. It was the, Rome was like the center of the world's universe at that time, all right? It was the capital. It's where all politics, people from everywhere wanted to came to Rome for influence, things like that. And he said, if I can get a church started at Rome, if we can get that really going, we will just spread out through the world. He just looked at it. That was a great communication, a great way logistically to spread out. Now, Paul had hoped that he would be able to go and preach at Rome, but it didn't quite work out that way. Paul finds himself a prisoner in Rome under house arrest, chained to an elite soldier from what's called the Praetorial Guard. They were the guards who guarded the emperor of Rome. They had them guarding Paul. And he had no freedom to preach. He had some freedom in house arrest. People could come to him, but he wasn't going to hold a big old revival meeting, you know, type thing. He wasn't going to do that. Now, that's the situation. And the reason I went to that is because imagine if you were a young church and you see this tremendous growth, but yet, remember, they're persecuted. They're suffering. As a Christian, you could, they could come and take your children. They could take your family, pull you apart. They would put you in jail. They would feed you to lines. There was all kinds of persecution. And now, to add to that persecution, one of your main leaders is in prison. You think that would cause a little anxiety? You think that would have some ripple effects in the church? Well, I think it would too. And Paul responds to that. I love it. In Philippians 4, and that's where we want to look this morning. We want to look in Philippians chapter 4. He's, keep in mind, he's, he's in prison. He's in prison, even though it's house arrest. He is chained to a soldier 24-7. They change soldiers three to four times a day. And this is what he writes. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's what he writes to the Philippians to spread to the other churches that here I am in prison and here's what I want to tell you. Rejoice in the Lord always. You know what? I like to hear that. I like to hear it when everything's good, when there's no crisis, when church gets really full of people and everybody's excited about serving the Lord. It's easy to say, rejoice in the Lord always, isn't it? We raise our hands. What about when it's not that way? What about when you have a financial crisis? crisis in your marriage, in your family? What about when somebody's really sick? What does Paul say? Rejoice in the Lord always. See, the always means there is no circumstance we can't rejoice in the Lord in. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice goes on in verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. He's reminding the Philippians and us that as Christians, God 
is in us. The Holy Spirit is near. He can't get closer than being in you. He's near. He has not left you. Simply because your situation has changed something, God is near you. So what does that mean? Verse 6, don't be anxious about anything. Let me say that again. Don't be anxious about anything. Now, I want to stop. I want to ask you. Confession time, church. Confession time. All right? Think about the last week. Just the last week. Think about watching the news or something. You went to your phone and said, oh, my word. Have you been anxious about anything in the last week? I have. Come on, sinners, raise your hand. We have, right? It's really hard. It's really hard not to be anxious, not to say, oh, my word, what is going on with the world? If we ever said, oh, man, I wish it was like when I was growing up, that's a sign we're anxious. That's how we're handling it. You know, we, we experience anxiety. There's some people, we get anxious, it's an anxiety. Some people, they have anxiety attacks. Some people deal with anxiety all the time. It's almost an emotional, mental condition. It's difficult. And that's why we're looking at the, this series when anxiety attacks. And I think, it, like this morning, if we're honest, we all experience it. We all do. It can hit us quick. Parents, you know the difference between a child crying because they didn't get a toy or something to when a child's hurt. An immediate anxiety that comes with that. Rushing to the hospital at times. Something happened. What's wrong with mom? That kind of thing. There's anxiety. We're anxious. We begin to worry. And I think that to understand that some people have to live with that so much, everything they see, often the things we worry about, trip that anxiety and then the experience of full-blown attack. Some people are disabled by it. But for many of us, we're not disabled by it, but we're really controlled by it. When I say controlled, it affects us. It affects our mood. It affects how we are. What do we do when anxiety attacks? Before we enter into that, I really want to pray. Would you pray with me? Our dear Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today. I just ask that your presence would be very close to us. Because, Father, I think, honestly, all of us here, all of us watching, we experience this. We get anxious. And yet your word is very clear. We're to rejoice always. Be anxious for nothing. And we really struggle with that. So, Father, as we look into your word, as we look for application for our lives, may our hearts and our minds be open to your leading this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We go back to our text in Philippians 4. I want to read it to you again a little further on. Get a little deeper into it as we go. Because the Apostle Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Now remember, he's chained to a soldier. At any time, at any time, that soldier can be told to bring him to a certain, certain place, and he's executed. That's over his head. For a lot of us, that would be anxious. All right? And Paul is writing to tell us, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, not just, you know, really bad situations, but every situation, every single one, 
And he says, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. By prayer and petition. What does that mean? Prayer and petition is we petition God. That's what we do when we pray. We pray and we go to God. You know, so often our prayers are just so, you know, polished. We have a lot of polished prayers. Let's be honest about it. I do too. You know, thank you, Father, for this food. God is good. God is great. And we teach and they're polished. And when I pray here, it, it, it's, maybe it's not polished. Some of you think, yeah, you could use a little polish on your prayers. But it's not the same is when I get really deep and personal with God. Prayer and petition that Paul is talking about is deeper. It's deeper. But he says, and with thanksgiving. So I want you to think about that text, and I want you to replace those words with prayer and praise. Because that's what it is. Thanksgiving is praise. No matter what situation I'm in, praise. So we are to have prayer and praise. We're to be thankful and we're to pray. We're to pray and to be thankful. Prayer and praise. And we're going to present our request to God. Present our request. I love that. God can handle our request. He can handle it. You say, yeah, but it's pretty big or it's pretty deep or it's really serious. He's got it. He's got you. And why? Verse 7. And this is where it starts to get really deep. This is where application. Look, if you struggle with anxiety a lot, you need to listen. If you struggle with anxiety just every now and then, you need to listen. Verse 7. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding... Why do we have prayer and praise? Because when we pray and we praise, God gives us peace. And it's not just peace that means, oh, there's no conflict. He's giving us peace in the conflict. He's giving us a peace that we don't even understand, that we can't comprehend. I can tell you I've seen this time and time and time again. And most places I see it is when somebody suddenly passes away. And a person who's very close experiences this loss. And suddenly, they are filled with a sense of peace. It's not that they don't have the loss. But it's as though that God himself has said to that person, it's okay. I have you. I have them. We're good. And it's a peace, a sense of peace that comes over a person. And you can't explain it. Because your heart still aches, but it's really good. Do you know what I'm saying? It's this sense that God is so good, even in the midst of this. He's got it, and there's this peace that no matter how bad the situation is, no matter what comes in this situation, God gives us a peace. And I'm telling you, there's no way to explain it. There's none. It is the power of God. It is the awesomeness of God. There's so many times in Scripture we see this. You know, I think back Elijah and Gehazi, his, his assistant, and they're in a city, and they're up on the wall, and they look out, and the enemy army has surrounded them. Now, that would make anxious. They're in a little town. The only thing separating them is the wall and a couple gates, and this massive army, and Elijah's just as calm as calm can be. He's got a peace. Gehazi, his servant, his assistant, is going nuts. What do we do? What do we do? Oh, my word, they're going to kill us. They're going to wipe us out. He's, he's anxious. He's having an extreme anxiety attack. And Elijah says, God, open his eyes. Let him see that you got this. And when God opened his, his eyes, he looked and he saw this massive heavenly army. Massive. And I can just, I picture Elijah looking at him and saying, you worried now? You worried? And that's our challenge. To realize that we have the awesome power of God as Christians. 
You have the Holy Spirit in you, in me. See, when we, well, let me finish seven. Not only will he says the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's important. Not only will this peace come over us, but it's the guard. It's the guard of our minds and our heart. God's peace guards our mind and our heart. So when we pray and when we praise, God gives peace. What's peace do? It guards our heart and our mind. Why is that important? What does anxiety attack? Our hearts and our minds. We worry. We do the what if, what if, what if. Anybody ever play the what if game? You ever do the what if if it, if it actually works out? What if it got better? What if amazing things happen? What would be, what is the best thing that could happen? But we don't play that what if game, do we? Perhaps we should. Instead of what's the worst that can happen, what's the best? What's the most amazing thing? But see, God, when we have prayer, when we have praise, he gives us peace. What does peace do? It guards our heart and mind. So we have confidence in God. That even in the worst situation, God, he has this. You have this. You see, when we feel anxious, when we have worry, what we really are feeling is panic. Anxiousness and worry is just a cover-up for panic because we don't know what to do. The situation's out of control. But what we would love to have is peace, to be relaxed, to be calm, to be at ease. How do we get that peace? That's our application. Peace is always preceded by prayer and by praise. You can say it this way. This is so good, you might want to write it down. It's not mine, but this was so good, I just had to just steal it out of this material. Prayer and pay, it's, it's, it's a lot of peace, so I'm getting a little. Prayer and praise are the pathway from panic to peace. All right? Prayer and praise are the pathway from panic to peace. Now, that really comes from Greg Grishel. I'm going to give him the absolute credit for that. In fact, it's so amazing. Like when you're a preacher and you can make things rhyme like that, you can put one letter together, I think you probably get gold stars in heaven. I do. It's amazing because you can remember all the P's, right? Prayer and praise are the pathway from panic to peace. And that's truth. What does peace do? Peace guards. Peace guards your heart and your minds. Peace guards. And you know what, brothers and sisters, church, don't drop your guard. Don't drop your guard. What's your guard? Peace. Where do you get it? Prayer and praise. Don't drop your guard. Back when I wrestled, all right? Coach Benz hammered this into us. You don't ever, ever drop your guard in wrestling. Ever. You come up, and see, it's easy to do. You're a good wrestler. You come up against a guy. He's been pinned every time he's wrestled everybody else. You think, ah, what do we do? We take him lightly, right? And the coach would say, don't drop your guard. Don't you dare drop your guard. Don't you think he can't beat you? Don't you think he isn't better than you? Don't you ever drop your guard. And if you did, and the guy surprised me, and the coach would be, you know, you drop your guard. You drop your guard. In boxing, if you watch boxing at all, it's you don't drop your guard. You keep your hands up. You do certain things. You don't drop your guard. Christians, church, we are in a battle. We have an enemy. Don't 
drop your guard. So when you have that sense of anxiousness, you have that sense that anxiety is going to talk, to attack, your application, your spiritual, scriptural application, prayer, praise, produces peace, which guards your mind and heart. Important. Essential. You can't have it any other way. Don't drop your guard. Your guard is peace, and prayer and praise brings peace. Peter tells us this. I love Peter's example of this in uh, 1 Peter 5, 7. You know, Peter was one of the apostles, and he was also one of the fisher, fishermen apostles. He understood fishing very well. And I'm not talking, you know, fishing with a rod. I'm talking commercial fishing on the Sea of Galilee during the time of Jesus. And he says this, 1 Peter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him. See, if you're anxious, if you're afraid, Peter's challenging us to cast. Now, I want you to think about this. He's taking big nets, big nets, and as best they can, they throw those nets out into the water. They cast it out. And he uses that language because he's saying what we need to do with all this anxiety and this fear that's in us, we need to cast it out. Cast it out on him. Who's the him? God. God. Well, how do we do that? Prayer. Cast it out in prayer on God. That's what we do. It's his thing. He understands it. Why can we do that? Well, he goes on. Because he, God, cares for you. God says, I didn't make you to handle the stress and the anxiety and worry. Jesus tells us, hey, does worry, if you worry and fret and worry about everything, does, can you get an inch bigger if you worry about it because you're small? Can you do that? No, we can't do that. We don't, our worry doesn't do anything for us but rob life. And he says, I don't want you to do that. I want you to live. So give me your burden. Give me your fear. Give me your anxiety. Cast it all on me. Why? Because I love you. And you weren't created for that. I can tell you that stress, fear, anxiety takes a toll on your health. We weren't created for that. Give it to the Lord. Doesn't matter what. Good times, bad times. You're worried about, how am I going to feed my kids? I'm a single mom. I'm a single dad. I'm struggling. It's really hard. From some of you, you, you got young children. You have husband and wife, and it's still hard. Because, boy, I'm telling you, kids don't turn it off, do they? Whew. They got so much energy, so much gumption, and you're tired. And you're, you're tired all the time. And you're pretty sure, wow, I didn't think this would be this way. I didn't know I could possibly be this tired. Cast your care and anxiety and worry on God. He's got it. And then he, Peter does something else and he challenges us. And this challenge is important. He says, be alert. Be alert. Do you know what's neat about that? You know what that sounds like to me? Don't drop your guard. Don't relax. Church, don't relax. Church, when things are going good and it seems like, boy, God's blessing us and then, boy, it's everything else, don't relax. Don't drop your guard. Be alert. Be of sober mind. Why? Because you have an enemy. Because you have an enemy. The devil who prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. I want you to know that the devil is always coming after you. When I say that, I want you to also understand the devil is not God. He cannot be everywhere at one time. He is not omnipresent. The devil can only be one place. He doesn't need to be everywhere. He has demons. He has, he, and, and the fact of the matter is we're sinful. We don't need a lot of coaching. Let's be honest. 
We don't, I don't believe that the devil or demons pop up every time and cause us to sin and tempt us. I think we do pretty good at that ourselves. Let's be honest. All right? But listen, we have to be aware. I have people who will talk to me and come up, and some of you have, and I appreciate it. I don't want to make it sound neg- negative. But it will come up to me and say, hey, I know that you're really under attack. You know, I know that you're having spiritual issues that you have to because of what you preach and what you do. And I want you to know I'm really praying for you. And I appreciate that because it is a spiritual attack. There are times it feels immense. But I want you to be aware as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are doing what we're called to do, you are being attacked also. If you're not, if you're sitting on a shelf, if you're hiding in a closet, if you join the Christian, the secret Christian alliance, which is very wrong. You know, I'm a Christian, but I don't want anybody to know about it. That's wrong. The devil isn't going to worry about you because you're not doing nothing. But the devil wants to attack those who are out giving the testimony of Jesus Christ that are causing ripples in the spiritual world, that are spiritual giants walking out and destroying his, his strongholds and bringing people to Jesus Christ. You're going to get attacked. You will be attacked. If you're not, then you need to look at your life and figure, I'm not being effective for the Lord. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and be a Christian jerk. All right? I'm telling us we go out and we be like Jesus Christ. Christ was no jerk. He loved people. He cared for people. All right? But he angered a lot of people because of his love and his strength and his abilities. How does the devil attack you? Well, I want you to realize that the devil's target is your mind. The devil's target is your mind. That is under attack today more than ever. Think about all the things that our culture, our people, education, every aspect of the world we live in today is after our mind. And it's things like, the Bible's not all true. You know, this isn't that. Why, this book, that was an, you know, just a story. That's not real. Or discredit the word of God. We'd look and say, you know, those sins, that was just to get you to help and behave and do this better. That's not an issue. That's this or that. It attacks our minds, the way we think about things, the way we look at things. Our minds are constantly under attack. And do you know how he attacks our minds? His weapon is lies. He is the father of lies. Everything he says is a lie, even when he speaks the truth, because the truth is simply a way to get him to lie to us. He has a motive about everything, and it's a lie. Satan cannot hurt God, so he hurts the thing, the person that God loves. He goes after our minds. His weapon is lies. He tells you things when you're going through difficult times. You're not going to be able to make rent. You're not going to be able to feed your kids. Hey, your marriage is shot. Why do you even want to try? Why bother? Hey, you won't make it through. Things aren't going to be better on the other side. Constant lie to you. When you get sick, he's going to say, look, you're sick. Things are bad. You probably have COVID. You're going to die. Where's God? Lie after lie after lie, telling you you're alone when God says, I'll never leave you. But Satan tries to convince you because we feel that we're alone, but we're not. He targets our mind. His weapon is the lies. And you have to tell yourself again and again and again, he's a liar. He's a liar. And you guard your heart And you guard your mind. How? Prayer, praise equals peace. And peace is the guard of your heart and your mind. And Christian and church, don't drop your guard. Don't let anything interrupt prayer and praise. Don't let the devil tell you you're talking to a wall. You're not. We're talking to our Father.
There's times. I'm going to be very honest with you. As a pastor, I want to lead from a, a, a position of strength spiritually. Spiritually. But I don't always feel that way. I don't always feel like I get up here and, man, I'm just, I'm on the wall. I got the armor on. I'm going to tell you, there's times, and this is one of these times. I'm going to be very honest. I feel really tired. I'm tired. And it isn't just church. It isn't just the things. And so church has been busy. This pandemic has made life a lot busier for some reason. And I'm not sure why. But it's made life busy. And it made life difficult. Because we have struggles, and we've talked about this, been very honest. Look, we, we messed up. We should have did this. We do that. And, and it's difficult. Which way do we do? Which way? I talk about it all the time. Every time pastors are together, we just had the leadership summit. And every pastor that I talked to at the leadership summit brought up how's your church doing through this? And we begin to talk, and it's like, yeah. And everybody goes that, uh. Because the pandemic hasn't showed a very good side of us. Whether we like to talk about that or not. I have someone like Pastor Woody who loves to visit. It's his gift. And, and, and he can't. Now, you know, we're down to one person. Generally, it's a family person who can go to visit somebody in the hospital. We can visit outside, but when somebody's in the hospital, you want to be that way. And Woody feels that pressure. And when Woody feels that pressure, I feel that pressure. Because it's our church. It's family. And we can't minister the way we want to. And that puts, you know what I mean? It's that like you're not doing it. You're not doing it. We do it. Because we feel called to it. And it, it puts stress on. And then, you know, we don't see some people. We're like, I'm a touch person. I want to see you. I like to slap you five, do whatever, do that kind of thing. And when that, you just feel it. But I'm also papa to 11 grandchildren. We are a support group to our family. My wife and I love our children. We love our grandchildren. We love having them and doing it. And sometimes it's a lot. And sometimes it's not. And I don't want my children to think, oh, man, my dad don't want to watch the kids anymore. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying when you start to put everything together and seasons and, you know, like things at home, why does this break? Why is this this time? You know, when I'm tired already and I'm busy and stuff, why all of a sudden does my grass that used to be brown just two weeks ago is growing and wants mowed every other day? I'm not mowing it every other day, but I feel like that's how it's doing to me, sitting there going, nee, nee, and, you know, we're having those issues. And I'm on, I'm, you know, I'm president of the City on the Hill Association. Why they ever wanted me, I have no idea. But I'm, I'm in coaching and encouraging those pastors who are experiencing these difficult times and these pressures to do It's just so many things that are on my plate. And it's like, I didn't want all this on my plate, but God says, no, I, you, you do this. I want you to do this. And I can't not do it. I'm saying no to the things he doesn't tell me to do, but I gotta do the things he does. And he's telling me a lot of things right now you need to do. And I don't want, that's not a complaint. I'm just telling you, there's times I feel tired. And do you know what I do? Do you know what I do? And my wife will attest to this, not only because I'm hard of hearing, all right, but I'm going to tell you something. When I want to praise and I'm feeling the pressure, Caleb and WJTL get cranked up. And she will always come out and start talking to me and has to go over and turn the radio down. But I need it. I want to hear. I want to feel the vibrations in my chest because I want it to make me move. Because I go to the Lord in prayer, and I'm not praying these nice little sweet polished prayers. I'm praying some things sometimes that would embarrass you that I would say that to God. I'm just telling you. I have learned through trials and tribulations, and no use to hold anything back to God. He can handle it. I'm going to cast it on him. And when I'm angry, I'm going to cast it on him. And when I think it's his fault, I'm going to cast it on him. Because I just read Job again. And if you wonder and say, what kind of preacher is he? Read Job. 
And you'll find Job just poured it out to God. God didn't squash him. He talked to him. He reminded who I am. Job, I got this. God will handle it. Don't ever think he won't handle it. And I can tell you, and I have a session of prayer like that. I can get up, I can crank up praise, and I am revived. Got my guard on. I got my armor in place. Let's battle. Satan, bring it. I got my guard up. I'm ready. When anxiety attacks, whenever you feel worried, don't drop your guard. Go to prayer and praise. I often hear people say, you know, all I got left is prayer. What does that make God feel like? The only thing I got left is prayer. All we can do is pray. That should be the first thing we do. We should be praying. We should drop to our knees. That's the most powerful thing we can do. It's not, oh, the only thing left is prayer. Oh, no. No, you missed the PowerPoint. You missed it. Prayer and praise leads to peace. And peace is the guard of our soul. When we pray, we have the armor of God. You know what? When we don't even know what to pray with, have you ever been? I've been in situations where I can't even verbalize it. We don't have to. It says the Holy Spirit in us is already praying to God, telling God this is what's going on. God knows it, but we're to do it. It helps us. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. You see, anybody can rejoice when things are going good, can't you? Let's be honest. Boy, when things are going good, job's great, bonuses are coming in, kids are great, marriage is great, family's great, church is great. Praise God, we'll come in here, and I mean, we'll bust the roof out. It's totally different. It's a different atmosphere when the fog comes in and things aren't so great, isn't it? But he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Because we don't realize that that rejoicing, prayer and praise, and we can rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice, lifts the fog. Removes the sin. I will bless the Lord at all times from the rising of the sun until the moment it sets. Let the name of the Lord be praised. Paul wanted to go to Rome to preach and have a revival meeting. He couldn't. He's in prison. What does he say about that? Pray about everything. Worry about nothing. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. He writes to the Philippians in chapter 1. He says this. This is neat. His whole perspective about being in change is changed. This is so neat. Paul is assuring the church who's having anxiety and fear. This is what he says. It's become clear to everyone in the Roman leadership that I'm actually in chains for Christ. In other words, he's saying, look, everybody thought I was being brought as a prisoner, as a criminal, but he's here because of Christ. Christ, the whole topic is being elevated in Rome. People who maybe would never come to a church are talking about this person who the emperor has imprisoned is imprisoned because of his faith. And he says, I'm, I'm telling about all the grace and the goodness of God. It's, it's neat. He's telling us he is locked. He has his guards and they're chained to him. And they run on a rotation of about eight hours. So he's getting three new guards a day. Yes. Yeah, three. <laughs> I had to think there for a minute. And uh, what is he doing to the guards? Remember I told you, the Praetorial Guard. They're the elite guards of the emperor. These are guys that have tremendous influence. They're special forces. He is witnessing to them. It is said that Paul converted almost the whole praetorial guard to Christianity. 
Who became the captive? Who was the prisoner to listen to the gospel? It wasn't Paul. It didn't stop him. He witnessed. He shared his faith. Everyone in the palace guards know that I'm in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the other Christians are becoming more confident in the Lord and they're sharing their faith without fear. So the midst of persecution, the midst of, of a church that was facing death, suddenly Paul's imprisonment, you know, we always read that scripture that God will take what somebody planned for evil and turn it into good. And I'm sure Satan said, you're not going to preach it, Rome. I'm going to bit you. It's going to happen. You're going to get in prison. And God takes what devil meant for bad, turns it into good, and the church grows. The church grew in the midst of what normally would be anxiety and struggle. Now, let me tell you something. The parallel to us is amazing. When this pandemic hit, we were, I was confused. I wasn't sure what we we're going to do. But we've stepped up. People stepped up. Not me. I'm, I'm sort of like the deer in the headlight in this. and said, no, we can do this. We can, we can record it. You can do this. Do the sermons we do out. Somebody says, we got to start live streaming. You know what's amazing to me? If you were, some of you will remember, before the pandemic hit, I gave a three-year challenge to the church. And one of those things was, in three years, that we would have reached out to 1,000 people. And I'll be honest with you, when I said that, I felt that God was telling me that, but I thought, that ain't going to happen. I'm just telling you. I mean, I felt God telling me that, but inside, I struggle sometimes with doubt. Last week, there was a couple here. They come here when they're home. They're in the service. They're at a base. It's basically a transient base. Because I talked to them about it. Did they get connected with the church? And at this base, it's very, she said, that, and, and, and the young man said, they're very hard to get connected because you don't know when you're coming or going. So most come there who are Christians don't connect with the church because they could be there for six months. They could form bonds, but then they're pulled out and gone, just like that. So most don't go to church. But she thanked me for the amazing job the stream team has done from the beginning and the team before, before we even had stream. She thanked me for that. She said, you have no idea. And I said, what? No, no, she said, we're with you. Um, almost every Sunday, Sunday morning, we are there. And we have told so many servicemen and their wives about it. Groups are watching you. Guys, if you're there, God bless you. Thank you. Hi. We get notification from people in Florida, other states, other places around the world. Let me tell you something. Because of a pandemic, because of something that brought a lot of anxious anxiety and fear, it has put us in a place where we are reaching more people for Jesus Christ than if we would have never had the pandemic and stayed on the same course we were. God has taken what has meant for bad and he has expanded it. And when I think of the number of churches that Life Church has put on their platform, of other churches who are now streaming it through YouTube or other things, the gospel on Sunday morning is being flooded around the world. That is amazing. That is the power of our God to take what something we're anxious about and turn it into good. What do we do when anxiety attacks? You pray about everything. You praise him in all things. And whenever you praise him, we have peace, the peace of God. Let everything that has breath praise him. You start passing. When you, pray and, when you pray and praise, you pass from fear to faith. We pass from fear into faith. We remove worry and we have peace. Church, we have the power of a risen Savior. We have the power of the risen Savior in us. Remember, we're overcomers. 
We are saved by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We are told that we are more than conquerors in Christ. Don't ever, ever think that the devil isn't swinging at you, that he isn't attacking you. Don't drop your guard, church. We pray and we praise, and the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ. Church, we're in a war. Whether we like that or not, but we're in a spiritual war, and that's what Paul says. Don't drop your guard. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praising him. No matter what our situation, no matter what we're going through, prayer and praise produces peace. The peace that guards our hearts and our minds takes away our fear, our worry, and our anxiety. And that is a promise from God. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, I just wanna, I wanna lift your name up above all other names. For you alone are holy. You, you alone are worthy of our praise. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to look at this series, Not Afraid. Father, because we do, we struggle with fear. Too many times we let, we let Satan attack our minds with his lies and we believe the lies. And Father, I'm just praying this morning. I'm praying that we as a church continue to live and move unafraid unhindered, that we have our guards up, that we confront your throne in prayer and we praise who you are, for you alone are worthy of prayer and praise. You alone are holy. Lord Jesus, today we commit this church into your hands and your care. Move us, direct us, lead us wherever. Amen.